additional fee? Like taxes? I don't think that's a thing in fantasy worlds. Uh, when we return to the Martian, I go to the room to tuck the locket into a drawer before I head to the tavern to finish the rest of my chores. Just as I expected. Claude is not downstairs to die either. Urian and Garland have taken to training with each other, though they seem agitated that Claude is not helping them. At the end of the day, I hurry to my room, where I write a few words on a piece of paper that I put into the locket. A normal rose would have withered, so I offer this one instead, in the heartfelt thanks. I hold the locket tightly in my hand and start towards Car Claude's room. Oh, why is my heart beating so fast? I'm just giving him a gift. I pause at Claude's door, remembering the last time I entered his room. I'm sure it's okay if I just go in. I open the door to Claude's room, which is thankfully not locked, and step inside. Claude is sitting motionless. Claude is sitting motionless in front of his mirror, shoulders slumped as he stares at his reflection. He's shirtless and there's a tattoo this seems different claude does not notice me at first i notice that his hand goes to the tattoo over his chest and then i hear him heave a dead heavy sigh slowly i close the door behind me it clicks and that is when he suddenly turns to look at me at first there is just shock on his face and then suddenly anger again why do you do this again lucette came to give you something. I tightly grip the locket in my hands as I stare at him. And this was so important, so very essential that you once again missed knocking on my door for a simple delivery. His voice slices through my heart. I... I wanted it to be a surprise. I'm not in the mood for surprises, princess. In no time at all, Claude is suddenly right in front of me, his hands outstretched on either side of me, pinning me to the wall against the door. His face is close, his expression so fierce that I cannot bring myself to think of a way out. The only thing I can do is stare at him levelly, without getting angry, without crying. I won't share I won't show any weakness. Why? Why aren't you struggling or screaming at me? That's what the Lucette I know would do. Then you don't know me as much as you think you do. And you know nothing about me. I already have a retort prepared when I stop realizing that he's right. I barely know anything about him. No, I don't. But I'd like to. Why do you insist on poking your nose in other people's businesses? That's the only reason. It has to be. I'm supposed to help you, so why do you keep secrets from me? Help me. His lips quirk, but his smile is sardonic. What the hell does sardonic mean? Like sadistically? Sardonic. Adjective. Grimming. Grimly mocking or cynical. Wow. Alright, Karma. Calm down. Claude, I want to help you! In the silence that descends between us, I find that I cannot help but look at Claude's tattoo, the thorns twirling around the rose, his beautiful but it almost seems lethal. When I glance at Claude again, he looks crestfallen, his eyes glittering like he might be on the verge of tears. Secrets are secrets for a reason, princess. You should know that. If I could speak about them, I would, but I can't. And you bursting into my room without any notice would only make it harder. Harder for what? Princess, you can't imagine what this all feels like. What's he talking about? And that woman. I thought we were meant to be. What? She was so lovely. Her smile as bright as the sun. Oh, is he talking about the witch? Claude's eyes are far away. That's why. Never again. And then you ruined everything, Lucette. You cut me down like... I push my hands against Claude's chest, catching him off guard and forcing him back to stumble. I cannot take any of this. 
If I ruined everything, then I'll just leave. You, you can have all the time in the world to yourself then. The locket I bought for him burns in my hand, and I end up throwing it at his feet. L Lucette, wait! I ignore him as I run from the room. When I return to my room and lock my door, I feel too hollow inside for tears. It hurts to breathe when I think of Claude. I eventually manage to fall asleep, but only have snatches of restless dreams when my eyes finally close. Oh god damn it. Mom, go away! Go away! Mother, are you and father in true love? Like the fairy tales? I for I thought I forbid you to speak of fairy tales. Have you been reading them? No, mother. I heard someone in the palace talking about them today. Then I shall have to find that person and make sure they know what an appropriate topic of conversation in the palace is. But mother the true love and fairy tales sound so nice. Do you think I can fall in true love with a prince? Tears to one. True love like that does not exist. But... The love between the mother and her child is its truest kind. It cannot be replicated by anything else. All other kinds of love is an illusion. My love is all you will ever need. Do you understand me, my heart? Y yes mother. The Lost Prince. Oh, we're getting close to the end. Oh. Keep your stance straight, princess. Yaren gives me the warning, but too late on purpose. I can see the smile on her face as she effortlessly slides past my defenses and taps me on the shoulder with her wooden sword. I got you. Again! For the last few days, I have been practicing with Yurian and Garland because Claude still hasn't come out of his room. The knights offered me to train, and right now they are teaching me about ways to hold the sword. This is slow, but Claude did tell me I won't be able to master the sword quite so quickly. Claude! He made me so angry that one day that I could not even properly give him my gift. Yet, I still feel sad that he is not here teaching me himself. Come on, Princess, focus! I jolt out of my reverie and nod at Yurian. Okay. I ready myself for the next strike and once again get tapped, this time on the hip. Garland takes over after Yurian and then we do rounds where I try to hit them with certain strikes. They're both good at teaching but it does not feel the same with Claude's instructions. His lessons seem less like they were out of a book. Don't worry princess, it always starts out slow. Plan was just as slow as training, but look at him now. Garland whips his head around in Yurian's direction, his face turning deep red. Yurian, that nickname. But you're so much fun to tease, Lan. Be she beams at him, then laughs at his embarrassed face. Our practice goes on for a few more minutes before the knights tell me to wrap up for the night. I think I'm going to stay out here for a little bit. And get kidnapped again. Yeah, Princess, you know it's dangerous out here at night. If I don't return in 10 minutes, you can come back and check on me. Yurian seems unconvinced, but she eventually nods. Fine, but keep your guard up, Princess. I watch the two knights as they head back. I see Garland put his arm around Yurian's waist, pulling her closer. I turn away from the sight, ignoring the heavy feeling in my stomach. I'll just practice a swing for five more minutes. The only thing I hear in the clearing while I practice is my shallow breathing and the wind in my ears. Something breaks my concentration, however. I see a glimmer of color in the forest and I instantly stop, my hands growing tense in the wooden sword. What was that? I glance around at my surroundings and then I freeze when I feel a hand on my shoulder. I can feel someone's breath on my neck. This all feels familiar. Is this Claude? I don't think so. Uh, turn and point your sword at it. I'm pretty sure I recognize Claude's hand, but because I know it's him, I also know what he wants me to do. I duck away from his hand and turn quickly to point my sword. The tip of the wooden 
The tip of the wood is at his neck, and for a few stun moments, I think I've won. Even Claude looks surprised. It's really him! But then Claude's hands have moved, and he has one hand over my wrist and the other on my sword. <laughs> Good Lucette. You realized you had an opening, but you broke your concentration. Claude! Claude removes his hand, allowing me to lower my sword. I'm sorry, Lucette. I feel the breath. I feel my breath catch in my throat, and when Claude holds out the rose pendant that I got for him, I feel my cheeks flush. Yay. It's not broken. You accidentally left this in the You accidentally left this beautiful thing in my room when I Well I came to return it. Return it! Yes, you left it in my room, so I only thought it appropriate to bring you Bring it back to you. Does he really think I left it there on accident? Why would I leave in your room on accident? What? I bought it for you and wanted to give it to you, but you were acting so strangely and... Hod's eyes widen, the surprise clear on his face. Lucette, you brought this for me. Why does he look so shocked? Claude looks at me in awe for a few moments. His eyes go back down to the locket. He traces a finger around the intricate shape, his eyebrows slowly furrowing. It's a thank you for everything you've done for me. Who said? This is beautiful. He lets the chain fall through his fingers as he stares at the rose pendant in adoration. I feel my heartbeat stutter as he turns to regard me with the same gentle smile. He leans forward and my breathing stops as he reaches out to hold up my glass slipper necklace. He's standing so close to me. You really are a good person, Lucette. You completed your second good deed. I think some kind of congratulations is in order. Is there anything you want that I can give to you? I look up at him and notice that Claude's smile doesn't reach his eyes. He looks sad still. I feel like there's so much I want from Claude, but I don't want to ask for something that might make him sad. Yeah, I want you to smile. Claude looks at me, his expression's puzzled. He chuckles softly. But I am smiling. No, I want a real smile. One that isn't so sad. <laughs> you saw right through me. We have been partners for long enough. How about this one? He smiles a little awkwardly, and the quirk on his lips look more embarrassed than bright. I raise an eyebrow in confusion. No need for that look, darling. I really do appreciate your worry for me. I... Karma suddenly stops, his eyes wide. He puts his hand on his chest and takes a step away from me, his fingers clutching at the fabric of his shirt. Claude has a pained expression on his face, only making me more anxious. Not... no. Claude, are you okay? What's wrong? Uh, Lucette, don't... don't worry about it. He lowers his hand with a pained smile slowly fading from his face. This does little to reassure me. Was it my fault you were locked in your room for a long time? He just looks so uh, he just looks so pained to be anywhere near me. No, most definitely not. I was feeling under the weather. And also bitter. Bitter? Why would he feel bitter? Press not for you to worry about, darling. I think I know the nature of his curse a little bit. So, is it... If he falls in love with another woman besides the witch? Or does... When he falls in love with another person, does he die? Because that seems to be the theme for this game. For now, we should head back. It's late and you need to rest. I just got back from a patrol, so I would like to rest as well. Is... 
Is there anything else I can do for you? No, sweet Lucette, you've already done enough for me. He clusters the ro rose locket to his chest and sighs out a little with a gentle smile. This smile feels real to me. This is a beautiful gift and I will treasure it always. Thank you, Lucette. Now, shall we head back? I nod at him and we silently walk back to the Martian. When we make it back to the tavern, I feel tired, but also lighter than I than I have for weeks. Claude wishes me a good night before slowly walking off to his room, holding the rose locket I gave him tightly. Today, I am walking around town to do some errands with Claude. It has been quite a while since we have done this. Though we are here to run errands, there is also something else that drew me into town today. Yesterday, Waltz came back to the Martian and told us of an announcement the King was making today. Apparently, that announcement had been posted for at least a week's time, but Waltz had only caught up onto it after hearing about it from the crowds after one of his puppet shows. I'm not sure what this announcement entails, but I feel like I need to see the King to make. But I feel that I need to see the king make it with my own eyes. I can see more people milling about than usual, which means most of them must be waiting for the king to speak. I have a bad feeling about this. It's, it's not strange for the king to make announcements, but this feels so sudden. And with everything else that's happened to me, I feel on edge. Wow, Lucette, you made these bags sound a lot lighter than they actually would be. Stop complaining, Miss Karma. You get valuable experience out of carrying bags. It builds character. Seeing Claude complain is amusing, especially since I know he can handle the load. I feel like a servant. What does that make me when you made me carry all those bags before? An uh, assistant? I roll my eyes at him. We're both working at the Martian, you know? And then the thought strikes me. What do you even do at the Martian? Claude looks surprised at my question, but then he quickly smiles at me. I train the knights, of course. And I also attract customers with my beautiful reputation sparkle. I start laughing, and Claude's face flushes. Darling, I can feel the feeling you're laughing at me. I wonder. We finish up the rest of our errands, and then sit down in the town plaza to rest. Claude leaves briefly, and then real and then returns with a slice of cake for the both of us to share as a snack. I have a lot of things I want to ask him, and now feels like the right time to do. May I ask you a question? Of course, darling, anything. Do you enjoy dressing like a woman? I don't mind it, really. I appreciate the, th the beauty in anything. You girls get to wear quite an assortment of lovely dresses and makeup. It's quite beautiful. I feel more comfortable in my own clothes, but I'll feel, but I don't mind dresses. So, he, so he is a dress dresser. I was correct in titling that the video. I guess if you had to wear a dress for so long, you get used to it. Yeah, I guess. I guess so, actually. Not that I know, <laughs> mind you. I have another question. Now what would that be? When I was in the room the other day, you spoke about a woman. Were you talking about the witch who cursed you? Oh no, that w the woman I was talking about. He suddenly goes quiet and lowers his head. His expression fades into something more melancholy and I feel my lur heart lurch. Maybe I shouldn't have brought this up. To my surprise, Claude continues to talking. Shortly after I came to NGL, there was a woman that I met whose smile was as radiant as sunshine. She was beautiful and when she laughed, everything felt right about the world. Hearing him talk about mirror makes me uncomfortable. Am I jealous? Claude watches me quietly as if measuring my expression. Eventually he goes back to speaking. I knew her for many months, time passed and I thought we were truly in love. And then I... He goes silent for a few moments, his eyes distant, his expression pained. Well, th some things happened and I realized she only loved me because of my curse. She was drawn to me just as any other woman was. 
She seems of genuine comparison to other women, but in the end, Claude trails off and lets out an exasperated sigh. You were truly in love with her? I was. I've dated many women, but never fall in love with someone who had honestly loved me back. So then the last person he loved was that one woman. Claude looks at me and for a few moments he does not speak. Lucette, do you mind if I ask you a question? No, I don't mind. Have you ever loved anyone? My mom, of course. I was referring to a remote romantic kind of love. Romantic kind of love? What does that kind of love feel like? Allow me to enlighten you. He smiles at me and it is surprisingly genuine. Feels... It can feel simultaneously like floating and sinking. Your heart fu your heart stutters and you worry about small things. About offending this other person in some way. You wonder if they'll like you. You wonder if they'll like what you're wearing or... They would prefer a sandwich to a casserole when you treat them for dinner. You begin to find beauty in all of the things that they do. Their presence makes you feel complete in one way. In a way you'd never thought before. Ah, his voice. It's so hard to do it in such long sentences. You try to imagine without that person that you can't and find that you cannot. To even consider such a pain is painful so much that it feels like it might break your heart. Claude continues talking but my mind is already whirling though he phrases things in a way that still feels unnecessarily dramatic. I feel a tinge of min familiarity. Bleh. Familiarity. Bleh. That's a tough word. The things he's describing, those are the things I feel when I'm with him. Before I can say anything, we hear the sound of hooves and, the, and both of us turn. I can see the procession of knights along with the king on his horse. He normally rides in town like this, but today he's not smiling. And there are way too many knights riding with him. Is that... Sir Elcaster? Let's go find a place to stand and watch. As you wish. Claude... Actually, hold on. So... I'm gonna say right here, go to settings, and turn off music. Cause, um... I've been getting like copyright strikes for the, uh, uh, the videos on YouTube. And I just don't like ads on my videos at all. Uh, since it's a little jarring. Or viewers in my opinion um so i'm gonna turn off the music from now on and put on some indie music from people i i enjoy that's not it um Wait, what? Um, that is not what I was looking for. I was actually looking for a to what the heck? Hold on, sorry, sorry, sorry. Mm. There it is. Let's see. Upgrade this. Claude walks with me into the crowd gathering around the king, and we find a spot to spectate at the very edge, closer to the alleyways. 
My beloved citizens of NGL, I have come before you today to make an important announcement. Ever since I was given this crown, I have sworn to live my life for the people and to rule in all fairness so that our kingdom could enjoy great peace. The crowd breaks into an applause. I stare at the king, an uneasy feeling in my stomach when I notice that there is sadness in his eyes, though he is smiling. Then I notice Sir Alcaster appears to be hiding a smile. I don't like the, where this is going. The king's speech goes on for a long minute after that, with him detailing the commitments he's made, the goals he set, and finally his love for the people. The audience around us claps and cheers, but Claude and I are silent. Something's... Oh, uh, something is not right. I nod in response. To this day, uh, uh, I'm going to lower the sound volume too, because I didn't realize it was that loud. To this day, I keep this promise. I will never break this oath, for it is the foundation on which I rule. The audience claps again, but I'm silent, watching the king intently. Unfortunately, the unwelcome news that I bring you today gives me a reason to hand this foundation over to someone else. I have fallen terminally ill. What? The king's proclamation is met with shocked and angry chattering from the audience. I cannot hear anything that is being said over the cacophony of voices, but I know that the audience is dissenting. I stiffen as I stare at the king. He's lying! I can tell by the firm set of his jaws and the way his eyes flicker across the crowd faster than they ought to. The king has lied to me so many times before that, I can realize when he does it. I know this is unfortunate news, must come as a shock. But this is an illness for which there is no current cure. As for the question of my successor, he trails off for a few moments, and I think I see something in his eyes that hints at urgency, but I'm not sure why. Crown Princess Emmeline is unmarried and still too young to rule on her own. I feel a pang of irritation and confusion. Another lie. Emmeline could rule just fine with the help of Sir Mithros and the others. After much thought, I have come to the conclusion that our kingdom, which still continues to face danger from the witches, is best put in the capable hands of the commander of the Order of Caldeur, Sir Alcaster. What? I cannot hide my shock. The rest of the audience reacts similarly. Their sudden outburst a testament to their confusion. While I will be providing support and assistance from the sidelines, I cannot, in all good grace, continue to wear this crown when I know I cannot serve my people as they deserve. Simply put, I believe that the witches have gained more power in these recent months and that Sir Alcaster is best suited to deal with these conflicts. The, the fairy tale curse runs more rampant these days and there have been more reports of incidents involving magic. The murmuring continues, except now that townsfolk sound panicked. This can't be true. I don't miss the reluctance in the king's next words. Sir Alcaster has also just suggested a number of remedies to our laws, especially concerning our security and work hours. I believe that Sir Alcaster can better rule this country in this turbulent times. Please show him all the love and loyalty you have shown me. That... Uh... That uh, bastard. Claude has a foul expression on his face, and his words feel heavy even in a low whisper. I know the king. He takes every duty upon himself and would never hand this crowd to someone else. Once Sir Alcaster comes to stand on the podium, he silences them with a glare. Citizens of Angel, I swear to you that I will serve you as well as Gennaro had. That being said, I also believe some changes will need to be made. Sir Alcaster con continues to speak. He mentions things like curfews for safety, extended work hours, and additional taxes to go towards the knights. But I'm slowly beginning to block out the drone of his voice. What's going on? Sir, 
no, Alcaster must have done something to force the king into the charade. The king stands behind Alcaster with his hands clasped, his eyes alert, but there is helplessness to them that I have never seen before. It isn't long before the crowd's unsettled murmuring becomes agitated whispering. I'm stunned when Claude cups his hand to his mouth and starts shouting. There's only one king! King Gennaro! Claude grips my hand and starts leading me around the outskirts so people cannot spot him as he continues his shout. The crowd begins to chant along with Claude, and then they draw nearer to the stage where my father and Sir Alcaster are standing. There's only one king! King Gennaro! There is only one king! King Gennaro! Let's go, Gousset! The crowd is right next to the platform now and the chant carries on. Claude pulls me behind him, but my mind is on my father and on his desperate eyes. Hours later, the Martian's tavern is chaotic. People are talking over each other, trying to relay the scene that they saw in town today. Every visitor here is talking about what they witnessed. I have been in the corner of the room this entire time, trying to understand everyone, but failing. Delora and Parfait are not here to calm any of this calm chaos. Hey, princess! How are you feeling? I almost jump when I hear Rumpel's voice. Surprised? I can feel when the damsel is in distress, my lady. I'm not in the mood to, for your flirting, Rumpel. Oh, my apologies. I just thought you might have wanted some cheering up. Where is your partner? He went out to town to survey the situation. Karma doesn't, Karma doesn't do anything around the tavern, but he does a whole lot for you, doesn't he? I suppose that's the least a man in love can do. I feel myself blush. What is Rumpel going on about? Princess, you're pink. I am not. I feel, my mind feels all scrambled now. This is all Rumpel's fault. Thankfully, before Rumpel can continue talking, the door opens and Dolora walks inside to call all of the Martian boarders into the reception room. When I step into the reception room, I'm surprised to see two unf two familiar faces uh, standing beside the parfait. Emily and Ron. Both of them look downtrodden and discouraged. Everyone is noticeably shocked as they step inside. The prince and princess, where did they come from? What is happening at the palace? What of Queen Ophelia? We need silence in the room, everyone. Delora raises her voice, effectively causing everyone to pause. She glances at Parfait, who nods, then turns to look at Rod and Emmeline. Princess Emmeline, if you would tell everyone what you told Delora and I. The room is unnaturally quiet as Emmeline begins her story. She starts with the events of one week ago. In the middle of family dinner, Alcaster burst in with soldiers and seized her, Rod, and Ophelia in front of the king. Sir Alcaster said if the king didn't hand over his crown, he would kill us. We had no idea a coup would be staged. The three of them were taken down into the prison cells, with Ophelia taken to a separate cell. I'm just gonna repeat this. Sir Fitzgerald helped us escape, but only just barely. Fritz! Are you openly disobeying your father? I hope he's safe. Alcaster wanted to kill the king. I'm sure he still will. But he has no reason to. The king has already handed over his crown. I speak before even realizing. Everyone stares at me, including Rod and Emmeline. Alcaster is a foul bad. I only think he usurped the throne now without violence because he wants less resistance from the people. He never spoke up to my father before. Did you just say father? It's a log story, Ab. Emily looks between Rod and I, her expression confused. You know each other. We do. 
Emily looks like she wants to say something, but she remains silent. Our brother is still inside the palace. We need to save her. Uh, we need to save her somehow. And Sir Fitzgerald. What happened to Fritz? We don't know. He helped us escape, but we were spotted at the last minute. He told us to run ahead and leave him behind. We didn't see him after get. Uh, we didn't see him again after that, and we couldn't just wait. So Rod brought me here. Right now, we need to piece together the situation as quickly as we can, and then we need to figure out a way to save the king. I knew Spellcaster was up to something, but I never thought it would be escalate into this. Yurian, what do you know about this? Garland and I weren't stripped of our titles because we displayed Alcaster's orders. It was because we overheard Alcaster plotting something and tried to tell the king of his plot. We gave him a warning, but the king did not believe us, not with Alcaster and Mithros whispering in his ears. The king didn't think Alcaster was possible of such a betrayal. He thought we were trying to turn him against Alcaster for our own gain. And so Alcaster stripped us of our titles and banished us from the palace. Lady Parface found us, and while we were happy to help out at the tavern, we also intended to eventually do something about the mess in the palace. So Alcaster had been planning to do this all this time. I is power hungry. When we part for the night, Parfait and the Lord take Rod and Emily to a room that they had that they can share. It has been decided that they will be harbored here in Martian, a place that Emmeline apparently knew about but never came to because she wasn't cursed. Well, Rod did say his family knew he was cursed. I noticed Emmeline looking at me many times throughout the night, but she never asked me anything. I'm gonna pause this and change the mood. Let's do this one. The next few days are a muddled mess. Everyone is busy trying to find out what happened and what can be done to help the king. I am sweeping the tavern half-heartedly one day, my thoughts on everything but my chores. Everyone's been trying to do something to help out the up help out the past few days. Though I've gone quite a few trips into town with Claude to search for information, I haven't been able to find much. I feel so useless. I am finally on my break, so I decided to go to the reception room to rest. When I step inside, I notice Emmeline sitting on the couch. She waves me over as soon as she sees me. She hasn't really been openly spoke. She hasn't really openly spoken to me since she has been here. Parfait and Delore have been trying to hide her so as not to cause a ruckus in the Martian. Roma's rumors are dangerous now. You're Lucette, right? Yes! Rod told me about your curse. He said that you're the king's blood daughter. I'm really sorry. I'm shocked by Emmeline's sudden outburst. What? I didn't mean to, but I took your place. How could I forget my own fifth sister? We're not blood related. That doesn't matter. I would love you regardless. Emmeline was always trying to take me out and do things with me when I was still in the palace. I distanced myself from her because I thought the king loved her more than he loved me. I still think he maybe he does. We weren't close. I barely spoke to you or to Rod. Didn't he tell you that? He did. Well, perhaps now we can turn over a new leaf? Emmeline is as stubborn as always. I have more things to worry about than being her friend. I have to go. I walk off before the conversation can continue. Oh. If I hadn't been cursed and remained at the palace, would Sir Alcaster have taken me hostage too? Actually, yes, we have been there before. The hours tick by, and as the tavern is emptied for the day, Delora calls everyone together to explain what she and Parfait have pierced have peace together about the situation. Oh god, her voice. Oh, drink of water. And 
change the mood. Okay. Let's try this one. I actually don't know this one. All right, everyone. We've come upon some new information. The first is that Oddcluster has cracked down on the riots in town. Anyone seen protesting his rule is thrown in prison. Wow. The king always valued the people's opinions. Alcaster does not want opinions. He only wants to rule with an iron fist. Our patrols have shown that there is overall more security in the palace and around the town. They have been charged with keeping people quiet in whatever ways they possibly can. As we heard from the prince and princess, things have begun most turbulent in the palace. The king is alive, but it is unlikely he will stay that way for very long. One thing is clear, given Alcaster's motives to take over the kingdom, I doubt he will rest until the king is dead. The king's men have turned against him, and even if they are loyal soldiers still left in the palace, we can't contact them right now. One thing is clear. Oh shit. Sorry. Rescuing the princess, uh, rescuing the king and queen will be on us then. Wait, seriously? We just so happen to have people in this tavern that have a shot at rescuing them. Prince Rod has the key to the secret passage we can use to break into the palace. Secrets? Passageway? But only the king and the commander of the knights have the key to that passage. How did they get a copy? Who's going to join us on this mission? Urien and Garland both volunteer immediately, followed shortly by Claude and Waltz. I'll go too! The room goes quiet as I step forward and volunteer. Princess, we can't just allow you to put yourself in danger. I look at Claude, who is staring at me, shocked. I took up the sword so I could protect those I care about. Princess, you don't have an nearly enough practice. But I can help! I still have time to learn. I agree with Parfait, Princess. The print the palace isn't the place for you to try out your newfound sword skills. Then you may as well change me up, because I refuse to stay here while you all go and save the king. Princess. Well, she has been practicing. Pra yeah. Well, she has been practicing with the rest of us. Don't encourage her, Yurian. But it's not like any of us can stop her anyway. You're right. The princess is quite stubborn. Claude agrees with Urien, but I can tell that he does not like the idea of me going along with them. If we only had the time to get reinforcements from Karma's country. Karma's country? Rugantia. How, how is it possible that a Brugantian citizen can simply ask for reinforcements? Karma is the crown princess of... Or Karma is the crown prince of Brugantia. There is some shuffling in the room as everyone turns to gawk at Claude. Rumpel, Anis, Rod, and Emmeline all look shocked by this revelation. You're the lost prince? Lost prince? It sounds like a tragedy, doesn't it? <laughs> Just the way I said it too. Sorry about that. It made me laugh. Anise suddenly looks distressed as she fiddles her thumbs. All this time, and I never knew. I'm so sorry, your highness. There is no need for formalities, Anise. But... I am the lost prince after all. I keep my lineage a secret because right now I'm just a normal commoner. But you're the crown prince. Couldn't you still ask for re Couldn't you still ask for reinforcements? Even if I did ask for reinforcements, I'm pretty sure they would never come in time. Besides, I can't go to my kingdom back. I can't go back to my kingdom yet. He can't go back because he's still cursed. The conversation continues in a more solemn tone. Eventually, we start speaking of our plan to enter the palace. When the Details are all finalized. I repeat everything myself to make certain that I know what is meant to happen. 
Waltz will lead us to the palace, then, and Nurian and Garland will follow right behind them, watching for the most immediate enemies. Leave it to us. We'll deal with any resistance before it touches you, princess. And Karma will be watching me, watching from the back, along with Delora. A witch and a prince for backup. Delora smiles wryly. Claude rolls his shoulders. I'd like to think of us more as the closing act. Though, if all goes according to plan, we will have no need for either the opening or closing act. It is a small task force, which is better. The smaller the better. The last thing we know we want to be is noticed. We decide to meet again over the course of the next week to finalize our plan and carefully survey the situation in town before parting. Claude has taken to training me, Urian and Garland at the same time. Just the other day he had a, he had all of us attack him together. Even though I am nowhere near as good as the trained knight, I still managed to hit him once. I feel like things are coming to some sort of conclusion, and yet I still haven't done three good deeds. Today we finalized our plan for getting into the palace. We have mapped out where the king and Ophelia must be in the prisons, where the guards might be positioned, and how we plan on sneaking in. I never realized this, but... Who decides what's a good deed for uh, Lucette? Is it Delora? Like, does she like telepathically know what Lucette is doing? And then she just decides, oh, that's a good deed. Check mark. And just gives her a piece of the, uh, the uh, glass slipper. Or is it just like magical intuition that it just appears? Never questioned that one before because I'm like, oh, magic. Whoa. I sit down on my bed and I am about to lay down when I hear something. Hello, love. My, you're red. What are you thinking about me? I notice he has one hand on his chest tonight, but then he has been doing that more often lately. I notice it during practices and sometimes when I catch his eyes. Is he sick? Darling. I shake myself at the sound of Claude's voice. What if I was changing? You could have knocked. Well, you didn't seem to have the problem when you walked in on me changing without announcing yourself. That's different. He strolls inside and steps closer to me. He smiles at me mischievously. Oh, how so? Cat got your tongue? Claude shakes his head, his smile softening. I really didn't mean to come in to disturb you. I just have something important I needed to say to you. Claude kneels in front of me and furrows his eyebrows. What? I want to insist you reconsider going to the palace with us. As Parfait and Dolora have said many times, it will be dangerous. Nothing you say is going to change my mind. I want to do what I can to help everyone. Yes, and that terrifies me. Terrifies you? Music time. Um, I'll get the song for this. Yeah, That's pretty good. If your stubbornness leads to you putting your neck out there for someone, I would never forgive myself for your in injuries. If you want to help me, stay here, where, where you'll be safe. It's not, I'm not some damn soul that needs to be protected. I didn't expect lyrics from the song. Usually it's more instrumental, but this one has lyrics. Sorry, I'm gonna pause this one and turn on something else. Didn't expect that one. I think I played this one before. Lucette, all I want is for you to stay safe so that when we save your father, you can face him with a smile. 
I won't be able to face my father unless I am one of the people to save him. Stubborn as always. I sigh, irritation welling up in my stomach as I look at the look on Claude's face. He's calling me stubborn, but he's being stubborn about this. You said I've improved with my sword fighting. You have. You've improved so much because of your resilience and drive and because you're genuinely interested. It's because I have a good teacher. Ho ho. Your compliment is gentle music to my ears. Your compliments mean a lot to me, Lucette. My eyes fixate on the soft smile and at the gentle crinkles at his eyes. I, uh, our eyes lock and for a few moments, I am aware of a slight energy between us. I glance away hurriedly, not entirely sure of what would happen if I kept staring at him. My heart beats unsteadily in my chest. Earlier today, I comforted your sister when she started crying about things that had happened at the palace. Emmeline, why would he comfort her? I saw her crying downstairs in the reception room earlier today, without anyone there. She's a rather sweet girl. I keep thinking that the two of you are completely different. You're both strong-willed and stubborn, but she wears her emotions on her sleeve while you keep it all inside of you. I'm not hiding anything, if that's what you're implying. Mother always told me crying was weak. Claude stands up and leans forward. Before I know it, I'm in his arms. Lucette, I am always here for you. I feel flustered again and my mind feels foggy. I can barely comprehend what's in my mind or in my heart. Why would I say sorry? You never need to thank me, Lucette. But you've done so much for me. It's not just the for sword fighting, it's... Your patience, your company, you're saving me when I need help. That's not true, I'm sure. I'm the most selfish person in this tavern. All I ever want is things for myself. I never thought you were selfish, Claude. He puts a hand on my cheek and looks at me solemnly. You don't think that me wanting you is... He suddenly steps back, his hand on his chest again, his breathing heavy. I stare at Claude with wide eyes. Claude, are you okay? I'm... I'm fine. He sighs out slowly, but he sounds obviously pained. I'll go get a niece. No. I'm fine. I'm fine. I swear it. It's just a spell of dizziness. But you... He manages a small, tight-lipped smile before he straightens and shakes his head. His hands are visibly shaken. I must be tired. But Claude... Don't tell anyone about this, okay? I don't want them to worry. Why is he always so stubborn? He's obviously in pain. I clench my hands and fists as I frown at him. Why must you always be secretive? You're keeping something from me, Claude. I'm sorry, Lucette. Claude abruptly leaves the room, leaving me with my fragmented thoughts. Hold on. How many chapters are there? If there is like just one more chapter, I might just finish it in this session. Hmm. You know what? Screw it. It's been two hours. And I'll, I guess I'll just finish it and uh, see where... <laughs> if I get the good or bad ending. I really hope I get the good ending this time. I think a bad ending on Rod was pretty depressing. Today, I will land another hit on you, Karma. If you can, darling. Well, I welcome the challenge. Princess, your side is open. I bring my sword up closer to my side as Garland strikes me. Tonight is the first night I get to use a real sword as opposed to a practice sword. The sounds of metal clashing echoes into the night. This is what a real battle feels like? We've been practicing under skirmish conditions for the last few days, 
since tomorrow is the day we enact our plan. We are doing some last minute practice. Remember, fighting back to back is better than doing it alone. Claude dodges Yurin's sword as he speaks, but I notice that he seems to be taking special care not to look in my direction. He's been fine for the last few days, but I'm not sure when his pain will return. I only, if only he would tell me what's wrong with him. When Claude finally calls the end of practice, we are all exhausted. Good job, everyone. You'll all be fine tomorrow. Garland turns to face me, a soft expression on his face. And if it comes down to it, Yurian and I will protect you. Garland looks over his shoulder at Claude. Both of you, that's our job as knights. I'm quite capable of, capable of protecting myself, but I do appreciate your offer. It's late. We should all get some rest. The two knights excuse himself, leaving me with Claude. Who said you should go to bed? Princess? I have a feeling I won't sleep much tonight anyway. Be that as it may, you should still try. I'm about to retire for the night as well. Hmm. Definitely can't talk, so let's keep practicing. Princess, if you overexert yourself, your reflex reflexes will be slow tomorrow. But I'm nowhere as good as Yurian and Garland. You sure you won't reconsider going, princess? No, so please stop insisting I reconsider. I will go save my father. Claude sighs out, then leans forward to set a hand on my head. Who says, promise you'll stay behind me if we're attacked. And if at any point it looks like we might not make it, you're to run as fast as you can back to the Martian. But that's cowardly. Who said, don't you remember what I said before? Sometimes running is the right thing to do. Never run into an impossible situation. It's called a tactical retreat. Instead, fight to live another day. Promise me you'll stay behind me, please, Lucet. Give me the peace of mind. If it will make him feel better before going into this mission, I cannot deny his request. Claude's expression softens as he moves away from me. I'll stay behind you. Thank you, princess. Let's attempt sleep in, prepare in preparation for tomorrow. When this is all over, I'll pry Claude's secret out from him. With a wrench. Physically. Damn it, Claude. It's already chapter 8! I've learned almost nothing! Tonight, uh, tonight is a night, and everyone is just about ready to go. I can't get this feeling of foreboding off my chest. Everyone is gathered close to the door, ready to see us off. Everyone except... Princess! Rampel suddenly appears, and he's coming up to stand right next to him. What are you two doing here? Well, of course. We came to wish you good luck, just like everyone else here. We'll be waiting for you tonight so that we can celebrate everyone's return. Be careful. Uh, Emmeline, who has been everywhere with her brothers since they came here, is standing right beside him with a smile. I will pray for your safe return. Her smile wavers, and I can tell she is uncertain. Yeah. She has the Great Knights of Kadira, two witches, and a prince. She'll be fine. Rod's responses are curt as usual, but I cannot help but notice the hesitance in his voice. Even though he stares at me without expression, I, can, I think I can see a 